Module A, Clinical Trial Examples. There's only one section in this module. It is Section A1, Clinical Trial Examples. As I said in the introduction, we will begin with a general formulation of multiple testing problems, and I will introduce several clinical trial examples that will help us motivate multiplicity adjustment methods defined in this uh, training course. And the same case studies will be used throughout the course to illustrate the solutions, that is, multiple testing procedures that I'm going to introduce. Let us begin with the review of several clinical trial examples. These examples will help us classify multiplicity problems arising in clinical drug development, and they will also illustrate, as I said, multiplicity adjustment methods. The first group of clinical trial examples deals with the case of multiple endpoints, and there are three examples in this group. Even though all three examples deal with multiple endpoints, we will see, in fact, that they represent three different types of multiple endpoint problems, because the trial sponsor actually pursues three different inferential goals in those three settings. Then, in example four, multiplicity is induced by the comparison of multiple doses versus a common control. And finally, example five deals with multiplicity induced by the analysis of multiple patient populations. And by the way, even though the settings in examples four and five look different from the setting in example one, the actual underlying multiplicity problems in examples four and five are conceptually very similar to what we see in example one, which is the prostate cancer trial example. This is why it is so important for us to classify multiplicity problems and have a good understanding of different types of inferential goals in multiplicity issues arising in clinical trials. And also, one last comment. I have intentionally chosen examples from different therapeutic areas, including oncology, diabetes, neuroscience, because this will help illustrate an important point that multiplicity issues, of course, affect virtually all phase three trials, regardless of indication. Beginning with example one, this case study is based on a phase three trial that was recently conducted to study the effects of a novel treatment. The generic name is enzalutamide in patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer in whom the disease progressed after chemotherapy. The trial's design is very straightforward. As you can see on the slide, there is just a single dose or regimen of this experimental treatment versus placebo, which is in reality the best supportive care. So there are no multiple comparisons in this case study. And on the next slide, we see that the efficacy profile of this novel treatment is evaluated using two different endpoints. The first endpoint is based on radiographic progression-free survival. It is defined as the time from randomization to disease progression. And the second endpoint, overall survival, is defined as the time from randomization to uh, patient's death, all-cause mortality. And to understand the roles of those two endpoints in this example, it is important to understand how treatment efficacy conclusions will be made in this trial. Or in other words, if we use the terminology commonly used in drug development, it is important for us to understand what kind of clinical win criteria will be used in this trial. And when we say a win criterion, we think of a clinical decision rule that would define the outcomes that need to be observed in this clinical trial to conclude that the experimental treatment provides clinically meaningful treatment benefits. So formally, each endpoint provides independent evidence of a positive effect, and therefore the overall analysis in the trial is based on detecting a significant treatment effect 
on at least one of those two endpoints. Again, progression-free survival or overall survival. This is how we define the win criteria in this example. And this is how we define the positive outcome for the trial. So, of course, in general, it will be ideal for the sponsor to show that the experimental treatment decreases the risk of radiographic progression and at the same time the risk of death, but formally the two endpoints are independent of each other. And I would like to point out that in the original paper that summarized the results of this clinical trial, the two endpoints were labeled as co-primary and um, I find this language to be somewhat confusing as we will discuss in the next example and I would recommend to refer to those endpoints as simply two primary endpoints in the context of this particular clinical trial example. Here's another case study in which multiple endpoints are employed to characterize the efficacy profile of a novel treatment called the river stigma. In this case, as you can see on the slide, we're using an example based on the ideal study. This was a clinical trial to investigate the efficacy of the rivastigmine patch in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And very briefly, the rivastigmine patch was actually the first transdermal treatment for Alzheimer's disease. It was believed that by providing continuous delivery of this drug into the bloodstream, Transdermal delivery could offer superior benefits over an oral administration. But let's now focus on the underlying multiplicity problem. Let's go over the design and objectives of this trial and then try to understand whether or not the clinical decision rules or win criteria in this case are different from the rules that we defined in example one. This will help us understand whether or not the underlying multiplicity problem is different from what we discussed in the context of the prostate cancer trial. So let's begin with the objective. As far as the clinical objective is concerned, the trial sponsor would like to evaluate the effects of a treatment on cognition and global changes in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and we will assume for simplicity that this evaluation is based on a single dose of the experimental treatment compared to placebo. And in reality, I would like to point out very quickly, there were two different regimens examined in the ideal trial. So how will this evaluation be performed? Just like in the prostate cancer trial example, we have two endpoints. The first endpoint is a cognition endpoint based on the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, the cognition subscale. And the second endpoint is a clinical global scale, which, as you can see on the slide, is based on the Alzheimer's disease cooperative study, clinical global impression of change. And it's the same number of endpoints as in example one. But what I would like to emphasize here is that the win criteria or the clinical decision rules here are completely different compared to example one. In this clinical study, we must demonstrate a significant effect on both endpoints, not just one endpoint as in example one, on both endpoints simultaneously. And this is the reason why the endpoints are referred to, to as co-primary in this example. As stated in the FDA guidance on multiple endpoints, multiple primary endpoints in a trial are known, are termed co-primary endpoints, when it is necessary to demonstrate a beneficial effect on each of those endpoints to conclude that the experimental treatment is effective. The key word here, both endpoints must demonstrate a statistically significant benefit. So, to summarize, the general structure in this example is exactly the same before, same design, same number of outcome variables, but the underlying multiplicity problem is completely different. And of course, a solution to this multiplicity problem will be different from the solution that we would use in example one. So we're not done with multiple endpoint problems yet. Here's another clinical trial 
with multiple endpoints? Is that a different type of multiplicity problem? And the answer here would be yes, it is in fact a different type of a multiplicity problem. And in this setting, multiplicity can be avoided by examining the overall effect of those multiple endpoints. This case study is based on an unpublished clinical trial. In fact, this was a phase two trial and the patient population was an osteoporosis population. The trial was designed to evaluate treatment effect on functional recovery, again with a single treatment arm versus a placebo. The source of multiplicity in this clinical trial is the fact that three endpoints are utilized to evaluate the efficacy of this novel treatment. They are defined on the slide. First, it's endpoint number one, based on the timed up and go test. The second endpoint relies on the six minute walking distance test. And the last endpoint uh, relies on a pain score. A very important feature of this trial is that those three endpoints, as I emphasized on slide 12, are not treated as separate entities, but they are viewed as different components, different manifestations, if you will, of a single underlying clinical variable, which is functional improvement in osteoporosis. And as a result, the win criteria are formulated in terms of the overall effect of this novel treatment on the three endpoints simultaneously. What the trial sponsor would like to do in this clinical trial is to characterize the effect of this underlying clinical variable and uh, the sponsor can reduce, actually completely eliminate the burden of multiplicity by switching from three independent analyses or three independent comparisons one comparison for each endpoint to a single analysis of all three endpoints as a single instrument. This is a unique feature of this multiplicity problem, which reflects the objective of this trial. We have two more clinical trial examples, and these examples, as I said a few minutes ago, deal with multiplicity induced by multiple dose control comparisons and analysis in multiple subgroups or multiple patient populations. Example four is based on a phase three trial that was conducted to evaluate the efficacy of uh, an experimental treatment, saxagliptin, in uh, treatment naive patients with type two diabetes. Saxagliptin here, by the way, was used as a monotherapy in this trial and uh, patients were randomly allocated to one of three doses of saxagliptin or placebo. So example four looks like a typical dose fighting trial. We see lots of those in phase two development, but there's also a good number of confirmatory trials, phase three trials that evaluate the efficacy and safety of multiple doses or multiple regimens of novel treatments compared to a placebo, or sometimes it could be an active control. And I would like to mention that multiple dose placebo comparisons are quite common in phase three neuroscience trials. For example, a case study based on a phase three lorazidone trial in acutely psychotic patients with schizophrenia will be used in the follow-up course in part two to illustrate advanced multiplicity adjustment strategies. Three doses of lorazidone were studied in that phase three trial, and it could have been used actually as an example in this section. In this example, in example four, multiplicity is caused by three dose placebo tests, and the multiplicity problem in this trial is actually very similar to the multiplicity problem in example one, in the prostate cancer trial example. The win criteria are formulated here in terms of establishing evidence of a significant treatment effect at one or more doses. In opposite, the more significant tests, the merrier. But once again, from a formal perspective, it is critical to get only one significant test. So it is, so it is just a one out of many type multiplicity problem, just like the problem that we saw in example one. The final example 
Example 5 deals with a clinical trial in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. It is based on the Saturn trial. There is a single primary endpoint in the trial. It is progression-free survival. And there's only one dose level compared to placebo. So what is the source of multiplicity here? And what kind of a multiplicity problem does the sponsor face in this trial? We find the answer on slide 18. One of the objectives of the trial is to evaluate properties of this novel treatment as a target agent, which means that the sponsor is interested in a tailored therapy approach. The sponsor would like to test the efficacy of the experimental treatment in the general patient population, which is sometimes known as the old commerce population, and simultaneously in another population, specifically in the subset of patients whose tumors had EGFR protein overexpression, as determined by immunochemistry. In this case, EGFR stands for the epidermal growth factor receptor. So the subset was chosen based on the results of previous trials, and there's evidence that the treatment may provide enhanced efficacy in the subgroup compared to the complementary subgroup, and as a result, compared to the general patient population. The sponsor is pursuing two claims simultaneously. The first one is efficacy in the general patient population, and secondly, in the predefined subpopulation. And it takes only one significant result to claim that the experimental treatment is effective in this trial. For example, it is possible that this novel treatment may not work in all comers, but may be highly beneficial in the EGFR positive patients. And the result, if we now go over the underlying win criteria, realize that it's actually the same type of clinical decision rules that we saw in example one, that was the prostate cancer trial example, or in example four, which is, was the type two diabetes trial example. On the last slide of module A, I would like to add that the topic of subgroup analysis has attracted much attention in the clinical trial literature and the regulatory guidance documents. Both FDA and EMA recently published guidelines on this topic, and the EMA guideline on multiplicity discusses multiplicity issues that arise in confirmatory clinical trials with multiple predefined patient populations. For example, the general population and one or potentially even more, two, for example, pre-specified subsets of the general population. It is explained in the EMA guideline, specifically in section seven, how effectiveness claims can be formulated. A specific claim of a beneficial effect in a particular subgroup requires pre-specification of the corresponding null hypothesis, including the precise definition of the subgroup, and an appropriate confirmatory analysis strategy. Multiplicity issues arise if study success is defined by the demonstration of a beneficial effect of the treatment in the whole study population, or in a predefined subgroup, or in one of several subgroups. As you can see here, the issue of multiplicity is highlighted in this guideline, and we will be coming back to the topic of subgroup analysis in the context of multiplicity adjustments in this course.